The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, whether you're listening on TalkZone, by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or uh, connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. Our guest today, Julie Papievis, was a successful businesswoman working with Price Waterhouse as an account executive with SD Lauder. But she died at age 29 when a teen driver ran a red light and plowed into her sports car at 50 miles an hour. The impact uh, severely injured her brainstem, and her body instantly began to die. Paramedics were unable to detect blood pressure or pulse, and Loyola University Medical Center did brain scans that showed no brain function. Julie remained unresponsive in a coma during which she experienced a remarkable NDE. Hospital staff saw no hope of recovery, but her parents refused to give up, and their church family prayed for a miracle. To the astonishment of her doctors, six weeks after the accident, Julie woke up with a remarkable story to tell of her experience on the other side. Today, Julie has a national speaking and lecturing career as a survivor of traumatic brain stem injury. She's appeared on the 700 Club, CNN, WGN News, and has been featured in First for Women magazine, the Chicago Tribune, Women's Day magazine, and Lifetime TV's Beyond Chance. She's the author of Go Back and Be Happy and an advocate for other survivors looking for hope and guidance. She works with the Brain Injury Association, the Spinal Cord Injury Association, and is a peer advisor to the Midwest Brain Injury Clubhouse. Julie, welcome to NDE Radio. Well, thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. Uh, It's amazing how busy you've stayed since since, uh, (laughs) what you went through. But let's begin more at the beginning. Uh, Tell us a little about your childhood and what religious training you received. I was raised um, in the Catholic faith, and um, I remember vividly making my first communion. That was a very big day, and um, wearing a lovely dress for that day. It was wonderful, and a largely celebrated event in in my family, and I also remember uh, making my confirmation. That day was especially, I remember it being especially great for me. Um, that it was all about the Holy Spirit. I've always loved the Holy Spirit. And so I felt like that day I became an adult in the Holy Spirit. And it was so exciting for me. And I felt like I was an adult in the church. And um, I had my godmother was a nun who has unfortunately since passed away. And also my great aunt was a um, a nun and she spent, and who has since passed away too, but um, she's been a lot of time at our family home and would talk to us and we would always say, oh, you know, because my dad would always say, you know, give it up to the Lord, just give it up to, uh-huh. and we say, we talk to him all the time. We pray and talk to him all the time and nothing ever happens. And, you know, we didn't know, of course, everything was happening. And my aunt would tell us, just talk to Jesus. Jesus is your brother. Just talk to him. And so I felt like I've always had just a relationship of talking to God, Jesus. Yeah. Did any of your relatives try to persuade you to become a nun yourself? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, they did. They um, talked to me about um, perhaps living a life of service. And um, and I said, well, and especially after my injury, no one really said that to me before. People thought that I should be a nurse versus, you know, a business executive. And yeah. you know, I saw you as like a nurse. And then afterwards, people did talk to me, you know, perhaps about a life of service. And I said, well, I feel like I am living a life of service. And they, they agreed. And they said, yes, you're absolutely right. So yes, yes, you are. It's my really? pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> it was in uh, 1993 when that car crash severed much of your brainstem. Yes. And typically only 4% of those suffering this type of traumatic injury survive. And you died on the way to the hospital and were yes. given a uh, rating of three, the lowest number possible on the Glasgow Coma scale. Yes. Um, the few who um, survive typically face a non-functional life, yet 
your brainstem and uh, did heal without uh, surgery. Yes. How, how did the doctors explain this miracle? Um, they explained that it was, well, and that's why I have um, on my website, go back and be happy. Com, the name of my book. I have um, the video, a six minute video, and I play it before every talk I give um, from the 700 club because Dr. Don Shane, my neurosurgeon who also has passed, um, good, lovely Christian man. Um, he said that I was deceased, you know, when I came into his trauma unit and he knew that I um, he had a, a death experience because he said you were deceased when you came in. So I explained it to him, my experience when, um, and I, well, back to the healing of the brain sound, I'm sorry. So um, he had an MRI done, a closed MRI where they put the cage around your head. Um, so, and he filled my brain and spinal cord with as much dye as I could to see exactly what I was he wanted to see the damage that was left. Sure. And at that point, they could not give me um, any anything to relax me because I had just um, woken from my coma. And so, you know, you're in the tube and you've got the cage around your head. And I was just, you know, trying to think happy thoughts and not be so afraid to be in the tube. And I, I really wasn't. Um, but, you know, you can hear the operators, you know, talking around you. And all of a sudden I heard them say, her brainstem is normal. Her brainstem is normal. And I'm like, I can hear you. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and Dr. Shea then called me in um, to read the results in his office. And he had, he really fancied himself a professor also. He loved to teach. And so he brought in, I've spoken at many medical schools because he wanted me to, but he that night brought in, um, a bunch of um, doctors who were starting their own trauma units throughout throughout the nation. And he wanted them to see, and he had me read the results that my brainstem was now normal. And he wanted them to see that, you know, that God, that he, the way he said it was that he said, it is not up to us. And he said this in the, he said that it was a miracle in the 700 Club interview. But that night he said, I want you all to know it is not up to us. This is not of my doing. I did not do this. This is of the Lord did this. And so he wanted them to know that. He's always wanted everyone to know that. So it's always a minor miracle when a doctor admits that there's a right. a greater surgeon out there than they are. For sure. Yes. <laughs> and he was very, he very happily and easily admitted that and said that. Yeah. Uh, do you have any memory of the car striking you or were you, do you think you were out of body at that moment? No. And um, I, I remember, so Dr. Shea explained it, that you remember in sleep wake cycles um, and that the last thing I remember was the night before going to bed. I had just gotten home. I took a trip with a girlfriend to Cancun and, so my brother had dropped me off at home and that's the last memory I had until waking up from the coma. And Dr. Shea explained that remembering the event or the car coming at me at 50 miles an hour, or anything surrounded with that event of that night would be too much trauma for my body. And that's your brain's way of protecting your body is to have no memory of that. Well, very interesting. Huh? Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's soul related too. I know I've interviewed people who just before a, a major painful accident, they, mm -hmm. they were out of their body uh, altogether, but, yes. but that could be part of your lost memory too. Well, then let, let's, uh, if, if you would um, tell us about your near death experience uh, starting at, you know, when you were in the hospital. Okay. So I love to have the memory of that experience to be able to, think about throughout my day and my life now, I think it's just that that sense of peace that I had. I just am so thankful that I had that experience. So I don't know exactly when it was, I assume on the way to the hospital when my body was dying, but um, all of a sudden I was in this place and I knew I was in this place because I was dead and I was happy to be there. I felt like I had gone home. It's where I belonged. I wanted to be there. I wanted to stay there. And when I say it was perfect peace, 
it's something that's so undescribable to this world. I've never felt that before or since. And I can't imagine that we do, we would have that kind of perfect peace sensation here. Um, well, at least I would. And so um, I was in this vast area where there were no floors or ceilings or walls, um, except there was this um, very narrow aisleway to my left-hand side. And the brightest light was on the floor coming up the walls of the aisleway. And I was drawn to go down there. That's where I was going to go because that's where I believed I was going to see God. And boy, did I have a lot of questions for him. I thought, man, I'm going to ask. I have so many things I want to talk to him about. And the first thing was, I do, I remember thinking this, this exactly. I wonder why he made that aisle so narrow. How do a lot of people get through there when a lot of people die in a natural disaster? That is literally what I was thinking. And then the next thing I knew, I was before my two deceased grandmothers. And it's not like I walked to them. It, it's not like that. It was just all of a sudden it was before them. And they looked to me, they appeared to me to be my grandmothers. Um, not like sick before they passed away or when they were younger, but like my grandmas. Uh, and they looked happy and healthy. And they were happy to see me. And I was very happy to see them because I thought, Oh gosh, we'll go. So I said, come on, girls, let's go. And I was pointing to the aisle way and I thought, how oh, great we could go down there together. And my grandmother, we all had blue eyes. And so her, I couldn't take my eyes off her eyes because her eyes were like these endless tunnels of blue light that I could feel that's where God's presence was. So after I said, come on, girls, let's go. My grandmother said, and it's like the thoughts were conveyed to me, not like she was speaking. She said, no, you can't go with us. You have to go back. And I all of a sudden felt very upset where I, I was not afraid necessarily, but I was upset. I couldn't believe it right here. But, and, and that's when she said, again, I couldn't take my eyes off her eyes. And then she said, your body will heal. And I was wrapped in the Holy Spirit. I could feel it. I knew it right then. And I felt so protected and I knew everything was going to be okay. I didn't know what okay meant, but I knew that I was going to be okay. And then she said, go back and be happy. And the next memory I had was waking up from my six week coma at Mary and Joy being paralyzed and feeding tube and diapers and all of that. All of that. It's interesting that some people who die experience like total knowledge. They have the answer to every question they ever asked, but you were there with a question, which was, <laughs> why is that? Why is that always so narrow? But I'm famous for that. When I was, when I was a little kid, I do remember. And my, my dad made the mistake of saying, you can ask us anything, talk to us about anything. And so I did. I always had a million questions. I, uh, and with Dr. Shea, I, I would go to bookstores and I would get books on the brain and I would read them and I would highlight things about the brain stem. Cause I honestly, before my injury, didn't know your brain had a stem and, and then like when, and so I explained to the schools that I talked to through the Think First program to the kids. So I explained that when, you know, in a mother's womb, when they're listening for the heartbeat, you have a heartbeat so early on, like six weeks into the pregnancy, because you have a brain stem. And that's what Dr. Shea used to call the candle of life. And he said, that's why when that is severed and damaged, you don't live. There's no messages getting through from your brain to tell your body how to live. So on your, uh, uh, on all the tours, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about uh, a little later, um, but you, you were actually, uh, giving information to people who were in similar, in, um, accidents and had similar handicaps and all of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, now it seems like you're branching more into the uh, near death experience side of, of your experience. Well, that seems to be right now what people are really interested in and wondering about. And like I said, I get to do. I get to do wonderful talks all over. And I think you're absolutely right that that's what people seem to be 
focused on right now because I really do think that people need hope right now in this world and need to believe and want to believe. And um, I've never had somebody say to me on the question, the truthfulness of what I am talking about, um, because I, I certainly wouldn't lie about this ever. And people, I think, really understand. I, I, I would say 90% of them or more of the stories that I have heard have been absolutely believable. Uh, yes. Let me, I want to go back to your grandmother. Um, you know, some people say they uh, have seen Jesus. Some people say they saw God himself in, in the light or um, many other relatives. But the fact that your grandmother's gaze, that you saw God in her eyes, it says to me that perhaps he used your, the form of your grandmother to uh, to make himself um, presentable. To yes, me. yes. Oh, I agree. And I'm so thankful for that because when I hear of people saying that they saw Jesus or they saw God, I can't imagine having to live with that because I would be so overwhelmed, I think, with the power of seeing seeing that, um, that I would become emotional all the time. And um, I I just, I I feel like it's, so when my father and I were talking, um, I was actually allowed just weekend visits at that time from rehab. And we were talking about my injury and we were talking about my experience. And he said, well, Julie, you, you realize this recovery is responsibility. And I said, I do realize that. And I've always taken, I've always taken that seriously. So I think if I had seen the face of God or Jesus that, I don't know, I think I would be just very overwhelmed for someone like me. It would be, (laughs) I think a little too much to take. (laughs) And God, of course, would know that. Exactly. uh, All right. So you are seeing your grandmother, but you're looking into God's eyes. Describe how you felt, what that did to you at the moment well i i couldn't as i said take my eyes off her eyes because it was just i was so drawn in and i could just feel i could just it was just a feeling i can't describe i could feel him it was just such warmth it was just perfect it was just perfect love just perfect and i i just I don't know. It was just a total surrounding of perfection. I don't know how else to describe it. There's really, there's, there's really no words here that I can use that people would understand other than it's beyond anything, any feeling of perfection that we have here. And it's a complete feeling of love and security that it's completely and totally embracing. Was this uh, image your um, your father's mother or your mother's mother? Um, my my mom's mom did all of the talking, and my mom is four ten, and my dad was over six six. So the grandma, my grandmothers are kind of relative <laughs> size, um, and I was um, close closer to my. Um, my mom's mom. And so she did most of the talking and my dad's mom was, as she had done, I mean, they were acting like the women that I had known. She was just smiling at me warmly and had her hand on my other grandmother's shoulder and was standing behind her offering support. So, and that's who they were when I would see them. Hmm. Were they close in, in uh, real, in real life? Yes, they were. They were wonderful friends also. Yes, it was a loving family for sure. And did they share the same religious beliefs? And uh... mm-hmm. yes, they did. Okay. Yes, they did. Um, but it was just that your mother's mother who uh, who you were looking in the eyes of and who spoke to you. Yes, and, you know, and I think too because uh, my dad's family is from Lithuania, and so um, my grandparents. Well, my my grandfather, my dad's dad, unfortunately passed away when I was only three years old, so I I never knew him. But people tell me I'm a lot like him. So, um, 
and that he was a nice man. So I, I love the compliment. And, um, and my grandmother lived in a Lithuanian neighborhood closer to the city. And um, I was um, born and raised in, in Downers Grove. And so that's where my mom's family is from for generations. Like I knew my great grandparents on my mom's side. Um, and they actually had been in Downers Grove so long. They had owned a lot of different properties in Downers Grove because they had just been there long. And that's when everything was farmland. And so they had horses back in the back in the day. And so that's I think that's why we ended up being closer because we were just closer in proximity to them. Mm-hmm. When we were growing up. Is there a strong uh, dedication to Mary in the Lithuanian Catholic Church? Um. Yes, I, I just think in the Catholic Church in in general that there's a, a strong strong, and I feel like for me personally, my focal point and my strength and what I have been yeah what I've been focused on my focal point has been the Holy Spirit. It's always been so important to me. I just always remember remember that. And as I said, I remember making my first communion. I was just, woohoo, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I just, yeah, I was, I was always just such a big fan of the, the embodiment of them, the Holy Spirit being the living spirit that's with us today and each day. And I feel like it's something that it's, it's something that we can share with each other in today's world. And is present in today's world. And I think that's just so important. Do you sense the Holy Spirit as a maternal or paternal? Um, No, neither. So it's a universal. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Neither. Uh, An embodiment of love. It's a it's a rich image. Uh, Jesus is given the credit for bringing it into the world, even though there are certainly in the Bible there are instances of something very much like the Holy Spirit already being here, right? At, at least in specific you know examples. But uh, to explain to people that it just rains down on us, this energy pours down on us and is available to us at all times, is uh, kind of shocking into to some who uh who aren't tuned into it but it's a well i i just think that you know sometimes you know when when um you know like i said as i was growing up and my dad was like you know give it up to, give it up to god and talk to jesus and this where so i think for some people um they can't really feel that they, they don't see it in their lives so to me the holy spirit is something that I can explain and talk to you about that it's just an embodiment that you can, that's everywhere. And so it's not like you have to have a certain belief in a certain God. It's just, it's everywhere. It's the spirit everywhere. It's the spirit of love and spirit of life. And that comes from God. But if people, you know, what, so whatever people call God, so that's why I think it's very universal, the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to remember uh, if there's been any other story like yours where if your grandmother was a vehicle for God's eye, Mm -hmm. where God essentially appeared as a woman. It's very unusual. Nothing's coming to mind that Hmm. parallels that, but I think it's important to note (laughs) that God is, you know, neither man nor woman or or incorporates both. El- yes. both those elements right uh, there are certainly descriptions in the bible where uh god talks about gathering his his flock under his wings like like a mother hen and mm. so mm. there are images like that and also um some links between sophia wisdom and the holy spirit where sophia wisdom is is sometimes described as um female in nature when into it, when I think when I say the word Holy Spirit, when people hear the word spirit, I think that's also too much more easily acceptable that there's just something that can be everywhere that anyone can feel that is part of everything. And when I say that you know, the Holy Spirit is a living spirit, it's living everywhere that we are. I think that that is just 
I some I sometimes think that's easier for people to understand. But it, it's so funny that you say, um, like you know, God brought my grandma up here through my grandmothers. I I remember when I woke up from the coma, um, I was so depressed um, at how sick that I was, and I and I I asked God, how could you leave me in a body like this? But I was so thankful. Um, the, you know, Dr. Shane, my neurosurgeon called my parents and I and later and talked about the suicide rate being so high for my injury because people normally don't recover like I do. And, you know, nobody knew exactly at that point. And I just felt that, you know, I was, I'm so fortunate that I had the experience that I had in heaven because I never once gave thought to seriously taking my life because I thought, First of all, I couldn't ever do that to God and show up and like, I'm back here again if you gave me this blessing of life and of healing. And I never certainly could hurt my family like that, you know, again, make them go through that. But I I was so happy that he sent my grandmothers to me because he knew that I would take the message from them and listen to them and be able to tell people about it. And I promised, I promised him I would do that right away. So I'm going to tell everybody about this wonderful <laughs> story, this gift of hope, and give everyone this gift of hope. Right. Well, uh, he also, oh, when when uh, your grandmother spoke to you, I, I take it was um, uh, mind to mind. That's yes. usually the way it's described. Yes. There was a exactly. transfer of thought rather than actual speaking. Absolutely. Yes. And uh, and uh, she did promise healing, that you would be healed. Yes. Which had to be an amazing, uh, uh, I mean, uh, certainly a, an incentive at any rate to come back to this life. Oh, the, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other thing I wanted to say was another thing that's unusual about this is the uh, suggestion that you go back and be happy. I mean, people get all sorts of assignments. <laughs> they, they get assigned, tell people what you saw here, go and and uh, and help people, you know, and, and uh, t- talk about God's love and so forth. She said, be happy. You know, but I think how did you it, understand that? Well, it, it, it took me a very long time to understand it, because when you think of happiness in this world, I think people sometimes think the car they want, the job they want, the house they want, or vacation they want. And I think happiness is to really explore and to really feel and understand your faithfulness and God's love for you. And I think that's happiness. When you really know that and feel that in your life, and that's something that you have, is that understanding that's happiness. That's happy. Now, uh, in, I would include in that happiness um, the fact that you uh, called the uh, young man who drove into you and uh, forgave yes. him. and forgave him. Talk, I, talk about that. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I just, I have been raised that, um, you know, all of us should go to the Lord and ask forgiveness and forgiveness is available to all of us. And not that I was saying that I was like the Lord and forgiving, but I just believe in forgiveness is what I'm saying. And so when I saw the reports from my accident and um, it it said that uh, he tried to say that he put on his brakes and all the witnesses said, no, he crashed into you at 50 miles an hour. There's no way that... So I was, I had to take some time and really pray about it, that when I called him, that I could say with an honest heart that I forgave him. And so I prayed about it. And so I did call him and it was um, probably again, like six months after that I um, got out of the the last hospital, but I was in and out of the house, outpatient hospitals for the next 12 years, but I'm doing outpatient rehab. But when I first got out of the inpatient hospital, I called him about six months after that. And um, he said to me, um, I thought you were dead and I got away with murder. Or I feel like, I'm sorry, I feel like I got away with murder. And and I said, I, I, I wasn't exactly sure what to say. I, I just said, 
then that I wanted to call you and tell you that I forgive you. That I And he really didn't know how to answer that. And I said, I want you to be able to put this behind you and to move forward in your life and know that I'm doing much better, that God has healed my body and that I'm doing just fine. And I just want you to be able to move ahead in your life and be able to put this behind you. And I am doing the same. And I, I actually... Um, he had to meet him because um, they wanted to make my story into a movie at one point, and I actually walked away from that. But um, for, for various reasons, but um, during that, some papers had to be signed, and and I met him, and he just really has never gotten gotten over what he what he did. And when I talk to the schools, so the Think First program, I say to the kids, you know, not only can you suffer this injury, but it's suffering with doing this to someone too and having to live with that and his mom actually contacted me too through my website when the book came out and she said he has never gotten it together fully personally or professionally because he just doesn't really know how to live with this and I said there's a lot of good help out there for you you really need to get help for this and you should because you you shouldn't live like this so I tried my best. It truly meant that I forgave him, but I, I tried my best to have him to be able to forgive himself. And I told him to forgive himself. This is a sort of a statement for the um, acknowledgement of purgatory, where you feel so guilty about something that you can't even accept the other person's forgiveness or to that extent, God's forgiveness until and- you work through it, either in this lifetime or the next. Right. And, you know, and that's what I, I said to my dad in, in, in talking about purgatory, you know, I really don't know how I feel about that necessarily, but um, I, I said to my dad, I said, well, I hadn't, you know, completely gone um, and, and seen God. So, you know, I don't know if that's where maybe he wasn't going to let me go down the highway. And my dad said, Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, you just, I think naturally we just try to put the the um, experience in today's world terms, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, I did for, I think, a while trying to understand things more. But then, you know what? I just said, stop that. It is, it was what it was. It was beautiful. And I'm just going to live in that. And my parents also said, you know, we all come from the Lord and come from God and we are going to go back to him. And so he said, you did go back home. To jump to a, a Buddhist tradition for a second, the, mm-hmm. uh, the, the moment that aisle way appeared in, in the discussions of the Bardo, which is a kind of a circle you go through in order to come back to your next lifetime. In your, in your case, it's your same lifetime. Right. But there's a moment, I think it pretty much at the beginning where you can step off the wheel and, you know, hopefully go into the light. And uh, maybe that was your moment. Do you feel like you had any um, moment of choice to go down that aisle or not? No, <laughs> no, my grandmothers were not going to let it happen. Oh, but I mean, even before you saw them, you saw the aisle. Yes. Oh, I was very drawn to go down. Very drawn. It's, I mean, that is, that is where I was going. <laughs> I was, and that, like I said, that's why I was wondering. I, I did. I kept thinking, I'm like, whew, I'm, I'm glad, you know, I'm kind of a little person. I'm like, I'm glad I'm small and I can fit down that, <laughs> down that highway because it's kind of small. <laughs> I remember thinking that. So it sounds like you had a, a momentary option, perhaps. Yes. Yes. Now. But well, then, then grandma showed up and said, no way. Well, and that's why and I thought, oh. yeah, that's why I was so disappointed when they said that I couldn't go. And that's why I asked my dad that question. I said, well, maybe, you know, I don't know. God isn't going to let me go down. And, and I'm like, no, you know what? It's just my, my, my work here is not done. It was not my time. Now, you're not saying that heavyset people should lose weight before they die, are you? 
Well, happy so people. How narrow is this aisle way? <laughs> it's very narrow, and <laughs> I just and, and I just think people should just be healthy, just so they're healthy and they can live healthy lives. That's all. But I, I, I think judgment just healthy. <laughs> I, I think spirit is more than flexible when it comes go, oh, to I'm going going sure down it is. <laughs> narrow places. Well, did exactly. you have any sense of your body when you were? Um, I mean, no. did you feel like you were in your in a, no. a, a spirit body that looked like yours? I have no idea what mine looked like. I have no idea actually what my grandmother's look like. No idea. I just know that they're I, I, I really I, I don't remember anybody's body. Necessarily. I, think, I think you suggested that you gestured to your left side and said it was paralyzed. It was a- yes, I, and I did everything with my right hand. That was and I motioned down the aisle way that we should mm-hmm. go down there. And I motioned to my left side that I can't go back because I'm not physically okay is what I said to my grandmother when she right. said, you have to go back. I said, I can't go back. I'm not physically okay. And I was pointing to my left side that was paralyzed. And the it, answer, that's when she told me my body would heal after that. But if you were pointing to your left side, it means there was some, you had some understanding of, of your body. Right. Some recognition that you were in something that would suggest your body at any rate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and how did I, how did I know, you know, that my left side was paralyzed? And I mean, to me, all of that is, it, it's just, it's so big where it, it, it is beyond understanding. So that's why, you know, it's, it's not of this world. It's of God. Mm-hmm. That's, that's when, you know, because I'm sorry, did I leave that part out about pointing to my left side that was paralyzed? I'm sorry in my story <laughs> yes. thank you for bringing me back um yeah that's what my grandmother told me that my body would heal after and i i just i did i wondered how did i know i was paralyzed but then but then like i said you stop questioning all those things and you just accepted that that's the experience that god had for had for me and wanted for me and did for me for whatever his reasons were. But, you know, I, I think about it now and I think, you know, when I told my parents first about having my experience in heaven, they said, hmm, we, we knew, we knew somehow that God had come to you because you've been so peaceful about all this. So they used to put me in biofeedback when I first woke up from the coma and I did cry a lot. And so they put me on antidepressant because I just cried because it was so overwhelming and it was so sad because I could not do anything physically for myself. But then when they started later to put me into biofeedback to make sure that I could manage the stress of my injury, I would just fall asleep within five minutes. They're like, okay, you're very relaxed. And I'm like, I was, I was very much at peace with what I had to do in terms of the work to heal my body. And I just kept remembering what my grandmother told me. So I thought, okay, here we go. I have to do this. Now, biofeedback, is that uh, tones that help you to relax? Mm-hmm. Like yes. to go down to the Delta? Is it, There's one tone that makes, that really calms people. Uh, that's, I think that sounds very progressive that they were using that. Yes, they they were um, well because everyone and I I did I said to my parents I go why does everyone keep saying to me they can't believe I'm alive <gasps> we can't we can't believe you woke up we can't believe you're alive and I'm like why do people keep saying that to me <laughs> <laughs> I had, I mean I had no idea like I said what a brainstem was I mean I was an accountant <laughs> well how quickly did did uh, your say the paralysis come get restored oh very quickly and so i mean um and th- and that's why they wanted to write a book about it and that's and they first started um with my visits i would see dr shea at Loyola university hospital all the time for follow-up visits and actually they brought me back by ambulance uh, because they wanted to start um wanted to start feeding me um for me to take in real food and, and get off the feeding tube. And when they brought me back there, the, um, the doctor who was ahead of the trauma unit, she said, oh my gosh, I never thought that you would be back here. She said, I never thought I would see you again. She goes, let alone seeing you 
to take out the feeding tubes, which is a very painful process, by the way. But yes. um, she said, I never thought that I would see this day. Certainly that I would see you back here. And I'm like, again, why do people keep saying that to me? <laughs> so, you know. Well, you found a wonderful doctor, I guess, in Dr. Shea, who who yes. understood the, uh, the the story of the NDE. Were there other doctors and nurses or other people you told about uh, that just couldn't accept the notion of a near near death experience? Well, one one um, doctor that I saw um, that um, he he did brain mapping and um, that kind of thing and really wanted to get into or really you know knew the intricacies of the of the brain in terms of just like the the medical parts of it the scientific parts um and but he 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 didn't do therapy like normally one-on-one but he was so enamored with my case and what he had heard about and so he really wanted to spend time talking to me and he really didn't know how he believed about you know uh, death experiences and about all of that. And after us spending a year together, he said, boy, oh boy, you have made a believer out of me. And he said, I absolutely believe that. And he goes, yes, what happened to you is absolutely the truth. And and he just could not believe that. Um, and two, he saw the healing of my brain, that, that my brainstem was healed and the miraculous nature of my healing too, that also led him to believe that made him open to really understanding and believing that. So that was wonderful. When you speak to uh, spinal injury groups and people that had uh, similar accidents to yours, do you find that they're jealous of the fact that you were given such favorable treatment by God? Not well. I I had a lot of survivor's guilt and I saw a separate therapist for that because mm-hmm. I felt I felt badly about that. And it was hard for me to speak to groups like that at first. Um because I did feel I I felt bad for them and I still do because I know how hard it is to be in a wheelchair. I understand how difficult that, that is and how difficult it is to not be able to control your bowel and bladder movements. I understand that. And it's a, it's a very tough life, very tough. And I've lost several friends who it was too much for them to take. And also from body sores and from other things, complications from being in a wheelchair all their life that um, they've lost their lives. And so um, I, I have spoken to some groups, I don't speak to a lot of groups like that purposely because I do understand why it would be hard for them to hear my story. Um, but whenever I am invited, I'm happy to speak. And um, they do accept and like to hear about my story in heaven because I think then they know that what makes my recovery and my healing available to me where it's, it may not be to them because they did not have that experience. So I think that kind of is the, is the difference for them, maybe, if that makes sense. Sure. And it also opens to them the future uh, rewards right. of being in the same place that you were. Exactly. That it's right. that, that, and that's going to perhaps even transcend bodily healing. Yes. The gift of hope. And that's what I, I, so you so you're saying now that you're more you find people have more interest in the the near death experience than in the um the miracle of your healing. Um mm. and you've spoken at Ions, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And now you're on this show. How how would you like to further spread the the message? Oh, I really um when I was in California talking about um doing the movie and that was um, you know, it's a very, it's a, it's a business there, very different. And I wouldn't have been able to um, tell the story as truthfully as the story is. And they told me then that um, a documentary should be made of the story because of the depth and scope and um, the wonderful message of healing in the story um, that a documentary should be done. And that there's, and I have been approached by several companies, but um, I just didn't have the ability to, 
to, um, you know, to fund them in any way. And, um, you know, and they said that, oh, we would do this. And I didn't feel right about that. And so I just believe that, um, I, and I hope actually, I hope, and I believe that God will have the story brought out in a bigger light so more people can see it because I just think in today's day, we, we need this message of hope and healing. And I think he will provide and show the story to more people that need to see it. That is my hope. It might be possible for you to find a charitable organization involved in spinal injuries to uh, fund the making of a documentary and then the proceeds would go to, to them to do further research. That would be wonderful. And I, I would be happy to do anything like that. I'm open to all of those things. Uh, I'm open to all of that because like I said, this really is God's story and not mine. And um, I want to get the story out there because it not, not only was my promise to him, but I think that's my purpose for sure. And I am so happy to do that. So yes, I would be happy to take it that one step further. That would be such, bring me such joy. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, uh, these days, what are you, uh, what are you, um, are you, you're still working with uh, some of these injury groups to, uh, mm-hmm. to tell them about your experience? I, I work uh, part-time at Fairhaven Wealth Management and I do um, what's called a brand ambassador for them. I have my accounting degree and, you know, we discussed my, what my PS was in business. And so I understand how important it is for people to have, you know, to save money and to have the right insurance and the right financial backing for themselves in case of a catastrophic event in their lives. And everybody has some kind of event in their life, Right. I mean, not necessarily as catastrophic as mine, but people have traumatic events that happen throughout their life and they need to be prepared for those. And I think me being prepared was essential in helping me to be able to go out and do the speaking that I do to groups. Um, Dr. Shea first wanted me to speak for the Think First group, Injury Prevention Foundation, that's funded by the College of Neurosurgeons and it was founded by the College of Neurosurgeons because he said the only cure for these injuries is prevention. And I was just at a church this past weekend speaking to the Holy Name Society. And there was a, a woman there who wants me to speak to another group. And other people came up afterwards to speak to other um, church groups. And I've speak, spoken to many medical schools and I've spoken to many businesses. And there was, uh, we just did our charity golf outing. Uh, and the charity was for um, first responders and families of first responders. And so I spoke to some folks there and they want me to speak to those groups too, to not only families, to give them hope, but also first responders to, you know, to help them to know exactly how much they help people and what the wonderful things they do for our lives. And so I speak to a myriad of groups and I've been able to continue to make those connections through working here. It's been wonderful. And so you're finding Catholic groups are also open to the notion of near death experience. Yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. this is this is a, a this is a change. This is a change right. For the better. I know. <laughs> for some reason, well, and that's one thing too that you know people and I've actually had um, people who who said that they have you know self proclaimed atheists and they said you know I'm atheist and after they've heard me speak like it, um, it you know um, when the when book first came out at a bookstore or some other kind of a um, charitable uh, function, um, they said, you know, your story has given me, it's the first time it's really given me something to think about in terms of that there is something more. And I'm like, mm-hmm, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. You said that they had talked about doing a film and then it fell apart. Can you tell us some of the reasons that didn't well, work out? I, I just, um, I walked away from it because um, all of the rights were going to be taken away, um, which gave them the ability to do uh, whatever they would want, pardon me, to do with my story. And I said, well, it's not my story. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and at first they had spoken to me about um, a documentary and actually um, one of the screenplay writers was somebody who had worked on the show Touched by an Angel. 
And he said, this story should be a documentary and this is God's story. And he, so he, he agreed with that. And, you know, it just becomes more about the monetary. And I just, I couldn't do that. I just couldn't do that. I, I couldn't, I, I, I had to stay true to this and to God. This is his story. I didn't heal my brainstem. I did not do that. And so this is God's, yep, this is his story. So I will, I, I try to follow what I think that he would want. I'm sure there's a documentary maker out there who would do this on more reasonable terms and with the proceeds going to a charity, as long as his costs were paid. I would love that. I, I, that would, I could just cry right now thinking about the potential of doing that because that is, that's actually my dream. And it's my dream because I think um, that would get my story out in, in, in a much wider range. And I think that's what God wants. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. I mean, it's for me, it's like I'm, I'm kind of used to all of the attention being paid to this. I really am kind of used. And it's funny because before, you know, I was an accountant and I was a marketing person too with, you know, Estee Lauder, but I was about, you know, the business of the business and, you know, pretty, I was a professional certainly. And so, you know, I think I did, I said to God several times, I said, I can't believe you gave this story and this gift (laughs) of healing to me. I'm so imperfect. And I'm so, (laughs) I'm, you know, not normally would, would be this person, but I, I do, like I said, my dad and I spoke about that and I take this responsibility seriously and I'm with pleasure. I'm so happy to share this story. So that would be my my dream to be able to get this out in a documentary for sure. Yes. Well, God loves everyone, even accountants. (laughs) Listen, if if there's anyone (laughs) listening who would like to, uh, you know, perhaps they're, they've gone through similar uh, injuries. Uh, if they wanted to to get in touch with you, is there some way to do that? Yes, they can do it through my website at gobackandbehappy.com or I have um, a direct email, jp at gobackandbehappy.com or it's also through my website, a contact me page, but directly jp at gobackandbehappy.com is the most direct way to contact me. And if they wanted to uh, pick up a copy of your book, how would they do that? They can go on Amazon and do that. And it's available in paperback and in Kindle. Very nice. Well, Julie, this has been great. (laughs) Oh, this has been great. I love doing this. Well, my I feel like to- I can't have the best kept secret, so I'm so happy to share it. <laughs> so thank you for allowing me to do that. Well, um, on behalf of our audience, I thank you for sharing your story. It's really, my pleasure. It's really terrific. And, and so much of it is, you know, the result, not only the healing, but how you've been taking the message out to others who've been injured as well. But I think God knew that, right? I mean, he obviously knew that I would do that. So that's exactly why he sent you back here. I am sure. Right. Yep. Thanks to grandma for that. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you for telling me those certain things you've also shared with me. I feel like I learn so much from other people who have had, you know, experiences as well. I, I feel, I just feel like I've always been the person who loves to learn. I love to ask questions. I love to learn. I love to listen to people and hear more about their experiences. And I'm happy when people come up to me after I talk. And and that's another reason for wanting to do the documentary. It just is going to create such a dialogue in speaking about this kind of thing more. And and that's what God wants. He just wants people to be able to, you know, talk to him and want to know more about him and to have a relationship. And this is the way I think to further that relationship. Yeah. We're all part of the light and we all want to connect with one another. Yes. Thanks again. Julie. Thank you. Oh <laughs> All my right. gosh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for it's an honor to be asked for sure. If listeners would like to hear this show again or any of our more than 470 archived ad free NDE interviews, go to Talk Zone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. 
And be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening. <laughs>